Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Scott Peterson gets a new sentence for killing his wife, Lacey, and their unborn son. Now he's hoping for another chance at freedom. Now, I covered this trial, and I sure don't think he should get it. We're taking you behind the headlines, but first, the trial of former Minnesota police officer Kim Potter started today. And I'll tell you that I think legally this is a close case. Potter shot and killed 20-year-old Dante Wright in April after seemingly mistaking her handgun for her taser. Now, the single most important thing in this trial will be the body cam video of the moment it happened. Wright was pulled over for an expired tag, but then when officers realized he had an outstanding warrant on a weapons violation, they tried to arrest him, and he resisted. Here's the moment of the shooting that will prove critical in the trial. The 26-year vet of the Brooklyn Center Police Force is charged with first-degree and second-degree manslaughter. Potter has pleaded not guilty to both charges and is expected to testify. Now, look, clearly it was a mistake. But the question is, was she criminally negligent or reckless in confusing the gun for a taser? The prosecution argued she was. Now, as soon as she gets involved, she escalates the situation. She acts rashly and impetuously. She draws her firearm. She draws it with her right hand from the right side of her duty belt, where she's always kept her gun. She draws it with her finger on the trigger. And she points it directly at Dante Wright's chest. The defendant says, I'll tase you. And then she says again, I'll tase you a second time. And then, taser, 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 which prompts the officers to let go of Dante's arms and then disengage. But she points the gun at Dante for more than one, two, three, four, five and a half seconds. Aims, pulls the trigger, and fires into his chest. She had firearm training and taser training every single year. She had to be requalified on her firearm every year. She had to be tested and recertified on her taser every year in order to carry it. And she had additional training just a month before this incident. And meanwhile, the defense painted a very different picture that Dante Wright escalated the situation, that she had to stop him from possibly killing a fellow officer, and that this was a tragic mistake. Not a crime. She said, I'll tase you. I'll tase you. The language was direct, it was clear, it was unmistakable. And all Mr. Wright had to do was stop. She can't let him leave because he's going to kill her partner. And so she does taser, 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 and she pulls the trigger, believing that it was a taser. For why else would she say it? And immediately, upon pulling the trigger a single time, which is the training for tasers, the training for gun is to pull twice, she realizes what has happened much to her everlasting and unending regret. She made a mistake. This was an accident. She's a human being. But she had to do what she had to do to prevent a death to a fellow officer. In Minnesota, a person can be convicted of first-degree manslaughter if the state proves that Officer Potter was reckless in her handling of the firearm. That could mean up to 15 years behind bars. For second-degree manslaughter, the state would have to prove that Officer Potter was consciously disregarding a risk of death or great bodily harm. That sentence could be up to 10 years. Now, last night on the show, we were joined by attorney Terry Austin, who will join us again in a moment. She thinks there will be a conviction, 
But joining me now is criminal defense attorney Roger Foley, who doesn't even think that she should have been charged at all. Roger, thanks very much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right, so why do you take that position? Dan, she was, she was executing her duties as a police officer. When, when they pulled him over, the stop was good. We, we all know, everyone agrees that the stop was good. But the stop escalated, not because of the, of the police officer's actions, but simply because of Dante's actions. He, he has no insurance. He has no registration. He doesn't, he, he's, he's got a warrant for his arrest for firearm charges, and he's got a restraining order. Then when the officer asks him out, the officer is very gentle with them. They're, they're being very cautious. They pull him out to the side. He says, don't pull away from me. What does he do? He starts pulling away. Two officers enter the car. They're fighting for possession of the vehicle. The vehicle is a deadly weapon. The vehicle is a deadly weapon. We've all, all learned that. It's like the first day in law school. A car is an instrument, instrumentality of a crime. And at that point, those officers' lives were in jeopardy. I'm a defense attorney, and I'm saying this. She had every right. Now, she made a mistake, and she used the taser, but she had a lawful right to discharge the firearm because the safety of her officers were in jeopardy. And that's why I think that. Well, let, let me play a piece of sound that the prosecutor um, said today, because I think it's the single biggest problem for the defense. When you're talking about negligence or recklessness, right? Not that she intended to kill him. This is uh, number four on the difference between the taser and the gun. You'll hear about the differences between these two items. The color, for one, well, it sounds like stating the obvious, perhaps. The taser is bright yellow. The Glock is black. The differences in weight you will learn about. Now, the taser weighs 0.94 pounds. And the Glock, the firearm, when loaded with 17 rounds of ammunition, it weighs 2.11 pounds. That's more than twice as much. The Taser 7 has a safety on the side that you have to flip up right there in order to arm the device. It has to be engaged. And the Glock, the firearm, has no safety switch like that. It has a trigger safety. So basically, you pull the trigger on the Glock, and it fires. You know, Roger, I, I think that the point here is that you can both feel a level of sympathy for Kim Potter in that it was a mistake, and also listen to that and say, it, there is a level of at least negligence here in the fact that she wasn't able to distinguish between the two, no? No, this is where I disagree. In the moment of a fire situation, whether you're in war, whether you're a police officer on the street, not knowing what, what you're going to encounter in a car, they already know that this, this gentleman has a warrant for his arrest that for, for a firearm charge. They know that there's a restraining order out. He could have reached into that car and grabbed a firearm. They don't know. It's easy to Monday morning quarterback, but at that time, that officer's not going, well, this weighs about a pound and two, and you're not looking at your firearm. It's a trained move. You're going quick, and there's a struggle because she's even trying at first to, to get in there to help. Um, and at that point, it, it's a quick reaction. She did grab the wrong firearm, but again, even if she was intending to use the firearm, I, I think it's justifiable in this situation because of the actions of, of Dante. But I don't, I don't think the defense is even arguing that the shooting was justified, right? I mean, are they? I mean, I think they're arguing that she had the justification to use her taser and that she made a mistake. But I don't even think the defense here is arguing that the shooting was justified, right? Well, well I, I, I don't know that they're arguing that, but, you know, they, yeah, they I talked I don't about think all they the are. things. Yeah. Like, you heard that great, that cross-examination was, was very good by the, by the defense. Um, and they talked about the steps with Officer Lucky about, you know, right. maybe he was driving impaired, right? All these different things. So I, I don't know. I, I personally well, think that that's a justified shooting. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that's part of what they're arguing. But as I've said about this case, um, I think that there, this is one of these cases where I'm going to wait until I hear the testimony of the defendant uh, before deciding exactly how I feel. Because I do think as a legal matter, this is not a slam dunk. Um, I've said that before. Of course. I'm going to say it again. I think this is a close case. So let me bring back in Terry Austin, co-host of the nationally syndicated program Law and Crime Daily. Attorney, she also appears on the Law and Crime uh, Network. All right, uh, Terry, uh, you obviously uh, disagree. 
Um, and what is the biggest disagreement that you have with what Roger's saying? I mean, putting aside the issue of whether it was a justified shooting, um, it was a mistake, right? It was definitely a mistake, no doubt about it. And I think the prosecution has admitted this was a mistake of sorts. It doesn't mean she's not criminally liable. And that's because you went through the definitions of manslaughter one, manslaughter two. She was either reckless using that gun or she was definitely negligent. So one or the other. And I think the whole issue here is you have a trained police officer. She's been on the force 26 years. She knows all about the difference between a taser and a gun. She understands that she has lethal force in her pocket. She should know better. She should calm down. She should not pull out that gun well, and kill an innocent individual. Let me play um, a piece of sound for you because it relates to this issue of 26 years on the force. This is number six. This is the defense in opening statements today talking about her history as an officer. 26 years, she never fired a gun. She never fired one shot. She never fired her taser. She never had to. She was good at de-escalating everything and here that's what she's trying to do. That seems to me is a very helpful fact uh, for the defense here, because the suggestion that she was sort of, you know, wild and out of control and reckless, et cetera, does seem to me to be significantly reduced uh, to be undermined by that claim. I don't think it undermines the argument, because here's the problem. She's never shot her taser. She's never shot a gun. But she's been trained to do it. So something is wrong if she doesn't know how to do it the first time she encounters a situation where she thinks she needs to use it, despite the fact that there really was no reason for her to pull out a taser at that point. Well, really? I mean, even a taser? I mean, as he's, as he's trying to drive the car away with a police officer with his arm inside? I mean, I, I think it's a very strong argument that the officer would have been able to use a taser in that situation. Well, one of the things the prosecution was saying is there are certain ways you can use a taser. Right. That wasn't the way. If he's in a car and pulling away, you are not supposed to use your taser. So clearly she was trained. She had 26 years, but when push came to shove, she failed. Right. But failing, as we're going to talk about, because I'm going to ask you in a moment, because I want to take a break, but I'm going to ask you after the break and ask you both about this, because Roger talked a lot about what Dante Wright did, right, about his actions. And I want to ask you how significant that should be. And then also there was a new video that we'd never seen before that was played in court from the aftermath. And we're going to see Kim Potter right after the incident occurs. Take a break. Come right back in a moment. Also tonight. Thank you so much, son. Voice of a terrified mother, her boyfriend just ran off with their young son. We're going to show you some unbelievable body cam from the Phoenix PD coming up. Welcome back. We are continuing our coverage of the trial of Kim Potter, the former Minnesota police officer who shot and killed Dante Wright at a traffic stop. One thing is clear. She mistook her gun for a taser. She thought it was her taser, turned out to be a gun. She killed Dante Wright. It was a mistake. The question is, was it a criminal mistake? Was it criminal negligence? Was it criminal recklessness? And as I've said, I'm gonna continue saying it. I think this is a close case. We're joined again by attorneys Terry Austin and Roger Foley. There was a video played in court today that had never been seen before of the aftermath of the shooting when Officer Potter is seen from the body cam of one of the other officers there reacting to having just shot Dante Wright. Okay. I grabbed the wrong gun! I shot him! Oh my God! Okay. Kim, sit down. Oh sit my down. God! I got it. Terry Austin, I think that is going to engender sympathy for her. No question the jury's going to feel bad for her. But I don't think they're going to feel bad enough that they're not going to hold her accountable. Listen, everybody knows it was a mistake. And it is going to be hard to determine what the outcome is before we hear everything. 
but it was a mistake that should not have been made. She should have known better and she should not result in a death. I mean, that's the whole point. I think the jury is going to want someone to be held accountable for this. You can't just go around pulling out your gun thinking it's a taser. You have to think twice before you do but that. But police officers, Roger Foley, are afforded as a legal matter, and I'm not sort of making some judgment on the criminal justice system here. I'm just saying are afforded as a legal matter some leeway if they make a reasonable mistake. Yeah, I just don't think that, I, listen, I understand that she, her intention was to pull the taser and not the firearm, but again, all of the, the all of the things that we saw in that video, we saw him ignoring police officers. We saw him ignoring the law. We saw him get into a car and try to drive away with two officers in it. I don't think it's a, yeah. she used the, the gun instead of the taser, but this is not criminal. She should not have been charged on let, this. Let me ask you about that, Terry, because I've heard people on both sides get very passionate about what Dante Wright was doing right before it happened, right? And I've heard people who are on the side of the prosecution saying, doesn't matter. The bottom line is she still shouldn't have used the force she did. I've heard other people say if he hadn't escalated the way he did, none of this would have happened. It does seem to me it's relevant. It's not dispositive. That was a mistake for Aang to argue that in his opening. Why? No doubt about it. The first thing he said when he got up was, you know, we wouldn't be here. This whole thing wouldn't have happened if Dante Wright had just followed commands. But, well, but I think that may resonate with some jurors. Doesn't matter. Why? Because even if you don't follow commands, yeah. even if you try to escape, it doesn't mean you are the judge, jury, and executioner. See, but I think what is going to happen in this case is the jurors are going to have to make a gut call here, that this is going to be more than just about statutes, right? Oh, well, first degree, second degree. And it's really going to be kind of like a thing where it comes from here, where the jurors say to themselves, how bad do I think this was? And that's why I do think it's going to be relevant what Dante Wright was doing. I do think Kim Potter crying after this happened um, is going to be relevant. I think all of this is going to be important. I fear that sometimes us lawyers are going to be thinking about this too much through the very, very finite legal prism. You know what she didn't do? She didn't render aid. And that, I think, is going to help the jury understand. Not only did she make a mistake, she should have gotten up. She should have called 911. She should have had the other officers come quickly to the aid. They all said well, the around. car had driven down the road already at that point. That is correct. But, yeah. but apparently, she sat and did nothing. And she could have done something. She could have told the other officers, go make sure he's OK, or do whatever you can. Get the EMT here. She did nothing. F final word on that, Roger? Listen, there are other officers on scene, and you can see them clearly on the radio calling dispatch and saying that shots were fired. So EMT was called, and they were on scene as quickly as possible. So I, I disagree yeah. with Terry on that. All right. So she was emotion. That, that video shows her humanity. I'm going to recommend to everyone, okay, who cares about this case, watch her testimony. I've said this about a lot of the cases we cover here. I talked about it in the Kyle Rittenhouse case. I talked about it in connection with the killing of Ahmad Arbery. That watch some of the case. If you're going to come out and you're going to be passionate and you're going to be angry about one side or the other, watch it, please. I will. We'll continue to show it to you here. Um, and we'll continue to bring you the highlights so you can judge for yourselves what you make of the case. Roger Foley, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Terry, stick around. Thank We're going to talk to you about Scott Peterson and Jussie Smollett. But first, Chris Cuomo has been canceled. Now even his book deal is toast. Look, you don't have to like him, but does he deserve what is really the professional death penalty? My take up next. Time now for our Media Hype Moments, where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. So Chris Cuomo is out at CNN, canceled. But amid the news of Cuomo getting the axe from CNN, you may not have seen that he lost two other gigs this week. Amid the ongoing scrutiny from the self-appointed journalistic ethicists, Cuomo stepped away from his daily Sirius XM radio show. Now, I can understand his decision. Because right now, there are partisans and pundits listening to every word, looking to amplify and distort any comment he makes. So for him to be speaking for two hours a day on a free-flowing platform not a smart idea for Cuomo right now, and apparently he gets that. But more disturbing to me was the announcement from publishing giant Harper Collins that it won't be moving forward with a book that the former CNN anchor had in the works for next fall. Think about this for a second. 
His publisher ran for the hills on a book it's not due out for a year. I get why the publisher did it, right? The cancel culture mafia would have run them out of town. But based on what we know today, sort of nuts. I am not trying to defend Chris Cuomo. I am criticizing cancel culture. But many of those who typically join me in despising it don't want to speak up because they don't like Cuomo's politics. And let me say, there is still more to learn here, in particular about a newly reported sexual misconduct claim against him. But as of right now, I believe what we have is a lawyer for the woman who says she was ready to turn over information to support a decades-old claim to CNN, but had not done so at the time he was fired. So as of today, we may have a guy who is getting the professional death penalty for helping his brother respond to allegations that his brother insisted were not true, and because CNN says he was more involved with that defense than he told them. After all, who wants to defend a well-paid, brash, controversial, famous guy making $6 million a year, comes from a powerful family, He's been one of the most high profile people in all of cable news for years. That will not engender any sympathy. I understand this. But again, this isn't about Chris Cuomo. He's just the latest example of what happens when hypocritical and pearl clutching journalists break out the pitchforks. When the mob comes, they come for it all. Look, I got his suspension, but the woke media mob seemed incapable of separating misdemeanors from felonies. In the social media penal code, everything deserves the maximum punishment, complete and total expulsion, professional death. Now, when there's blood in the water, the media sharks circle and they don't stop until they devour their prey. I invited a woman named Alexi McCammon to come on the show today to discuss. She wasn't able to join us, but this was an immensely talented 27-year-old star in the making back in March she was named editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue, but she immediately came under fire over a number of anti-Asian tweets that she'd posted when she was in high school, 2011. These tweets led to a, a days-long furor with aggrieved staffers calling for her head. She apologized repeatedly for the comments she made in high school. That didn't satisfy her critics, who eventually got what they wanted. She was canceled from the magazine. And yet MSNBC's Joy Reid still has a job despite making homophobic slurs and then lying about getting hacked in an FBI investigation. Why? Because Reid has a base, an ultra-liberal audience that is ready to forgive her. So it seems the only way you can survive a scandal in the left-of-center media ecosystem is if you have both that built-in base and are famous, which McCammon was not. Every transgression does not need to be grounds for the end of someone's career. There are definitely people out there who deserve to be canceled. Others deserve to be prosecuted, but not all of them. And for those of us sort of stuck somewhere in the middle, it sure feels like the media world has gone mad. That's our wrap of the day's media bias and the buzz. Coming up, who could forget the agonizing search for Lacey Peterson, the heartache, when we all learned her husband killed their unborn child and Lacey. Today, Scott Peterson was back in a California court getting resentenced amid a bid for a new trial facing a judge, Lacey's mom and siblings. He sat there as they talked about their pain in open court. I covered this case in Modesto at the time. So we'll take you behind the headlines up next. Remember Scott Peterson 17 years ago? He was convicted and received the death penalty for killing his wife, Lacey, and their unborn child, Connor. Well, he was resentenced today to life in prison without parole after his death sentence was overturned by the California Supreme Court. Peterson's new sentence, life for the first degree murder of Lacey and 15 years to life for the second degree murder of their unborn son, Connor. In April of 2003, Lacey and Connor's bodies were found 90 miles from their home right where Scott Peterson admitted he had been fishing the day she went missing. Peterson was even at a vigil for Lacey and Connor on New Year's Eve, one week after their murders. He was arrested after Amber Fry, remember her, told police she and Peterson had begun dating a month before Lacey's death, and Scott told her his wife was already dead. Well, last year, the California Supreme Court ruled the jury was improperly screened on their personal beliefs about the death penalty, creating an unfair jury 
for Peterson when it came to the death penalty. The state there hasn't executed an inmate since 2006 anyway. Prosecutors could have opted for a new trial just on the death penalty. But Lacey's family said they didn't want to go through the process all over again. I understand that. Scott's family and a team of supporters continue to insist he's actually innocent. Now today, Lacey's family delivered impact statements and they have no doubt about his guilt. Lacey's sister, Amy Roca, saying, every Christmas Eve, I relive the nightmare we still all live in now. After becoming a mom myself, I think of how she was robbed of that most wonderful experience. She would have been the best mom. You have broken all of our hearts by taking Lacey and Connor's lives. Even though the death penalty had been lifted, you, she said to Scott Peterson, will still be punished in this life and after. You've broken all of our hearts by taking Lacey and Connor's life, even though the death penalty had been lifted. Lacey's mother, Sharon Rocha, Rocha talked about, I should know that, my goodness, I spent so much time with these people, lovely people, I apologize for mispronouncing that, talked about a dinner with her late husband, Lacey and Scott, saying, on December 15th to 19 years ago, one week from today, Ron and I had a dinner at your house with you and Lacey. All the while, we were there that evening, you were already planning her murder. And that evening was the last time I ever saw my daughter alive. All the while we were there that evening, you were already planning her murder. So the judge, apologize for repeating that, uh, the judge has also scheduled a week-long hearing beginning on February 25th to decide if Peterson should get a new trial on guilt or innocence based on a juror who did not disclose that she had been assaulted by a boyfriend while pregnant and obtained a restraining order during another pregnancy. Joining me again, law and crime host, attorney, Terry Austin, and my friend, Mark Iglarsh is with us. Mark, good to see you, my friend. All right. So, Mark, let me nice start to see with you. you. Again. Let me start with you on this, Mark. Do you think Peterson has a real shot at a new trial? No. Next question. It's that simple, <laughs> Dan. The, the bar yeah. is just way too high. The, the appellate court can find that there was some prejudice, there was some error, but it wouldn't have made a difference in the outcome. It, it, the appellate courts are just rarely in the business of reversing murder convictions. And so I, I think that he's not going anywhere. And I think that Terry, if the judge was going to overturn the guilt phase verdict, why not do it at the same time as the decision about the death penalty? Right, well, the judge said that they wanted more information to have a hearing to hear about whether or not there is enough to have a new trial. And, you know, the issue is whether or not there was prejudicial misconduct. The fact that this juror number seven withheld information about the restraining order and withheld information to the, you know, attorneys. Who well, she says it wasn't. Her. She says she didn't withhold it. She says she just didn't realize that she had to disclose it because she was asked a very specific question, which she says she misunderstood. The defense is saying she was trying to get on the jury, et cetera. It is, I have to tell you, it is amazing to me, Mark, how passionate the supporters of Scott Peterson remain, meaning he's got a really smart relative um, named Janie Peterson, who has been one of his leading advocates, who challenges every piece of evidence in the case to continually claim Scott Peterson is innocent, he got a raw deal. Now there are all these younger people who didn't cover the trial, who are listening to podcasts and watching shows and saying, oh, well, you know, maybe Scott Peterson really didn't do it. I, I have to tell you, from having covered the trial inside the courtroom, this wasn't a close case at the time. I mean, it's not like we were all biting our nails, waiting to find out what the verdict was going to be. It was only a question of, is he going to be guilty, or is it possible could they have a juror or two who hang the jury? I am struck by how passionate those people remain. I am not, because ignorance is what fuels so many people's misguided thoughts these days. It's so easy to feel a certain way when you really don't know what the evidence is. And that's why I applauded you, at least here in my kitchen, for saying to people, follow the Potter trial and watch her testimony. Don't just have opinions based upon what the media is going to tell you the testimony was. Watch it for yourself. Most people don't do it. They take shortcuts and then they get some bastardized view of what occurred and then come up with just these erroneous opinions. 
And Terry, I wasn't surprised that the Rocha family decided they didn't want to have a new trial. Just I mean, think about the idea of having a new trial just on the penalty phase, right? The idea of having to go through everything and all the evidence again just to decide, does he get death or life in prison without parole? Not worth it. Definitely not worth it. And we know even if he didn't get the death penalty, he would still be in jail for the rest of his life. Right. So it doesn't make any difference to them. And if he got the death penalty, they would be appealing it forever. So I think they realized they did not want to go through that exercise again. It's got to be extremely stressful. Yeah, look, I agree with Mark. Uh, I think uh, Scott Peterson has almost no shot. Uh, of a new trial here. This case is done. It has been litigated uh, again and again. And the facts, God, I mean, I don't have time to go through all the facts in this case. It's not a single fact. It's not one thing. It's look at the totality and it can't be anywhere else but Scott Peterson, in my view. All right, Terry and Mark, stick around because I want to get your takes on the Jussie Smollett. Now, that case is now in the hands of the jury. The prosecution today in closing argument says Smollett lied to police about his attack and now has been lying to jurors on the stand. The defense arguing these star witnesses were the real liars and even compares the case to one of America's founding fathers who I happen to have written a book about. So I'll have something to say about that coming up. Actor Jesse Smollett's fate now in the hands of a jury. Prosecutors and defense made their final arguments today. The trial of the former Empire star charged with six felony counts after allegedly filing false police reports in connection with a staged hate crime attack. The prosecutors say he orchestrated in January of 2019. Special Prosecutor Dan Webb today walked through the jury through holes in Smollett's story. He said there are six keys that destroy Smollett's credibility. Among them, that Smollett refused to turn over his phone and limited medical records to Chicago police, that he wouldn't take a DNA swab, and that the placement of the rope around Smollett's neck changed between the attack and when police arrived. Quote, his so-called explanation for jimmying with the rope got blown out of the courtroom, Webb told jurors. If he was innocent, the real victim of a hate crime, why would he be jimmying and monkeying around with the rope? He made it look worse and he got caught. His attackers confirmed Abel and Ola Osendero testified they assaulted Smollett because he paid them to do it. Smollett said the money was for training sessions, but the prosecutor pointed out that there was nothing on Smollett's phone to back up his testimony that he and Abel were going to go work out the morning of the attack, a critical part of Smollett's story. Webb also touched on the intensity of the Chicago police's initial investigation with more than two dozen officers spending more than 3,000 hours digging into Smollett's attack. He pointed to what he said was overwhelming evidence that Smollett arranged the fake hate crime and that Smollett tailored his testimony to fit the evidence and lied about the rest. Meanwhile, Smollett's lawyer compared the prosecution's case to a house of cards that will crumble under the slightest pressure. Despite nearly two dozen objections from the prosecution, attorney Nenya Uche painted the state's case as corrupt using doctored evidence, assumptions to target Smollett. But most of Uche's closing argument worked to discredit the story of the brothers, the Osenderos. The brothers had testified Smollett paid them $3,500 to carry out the phony hate crime. Smollett's lawyers tried to paint the men as habitual liars. The attorney compared the Osendero's story to an African prince scam and alluded to a possible accomplice of the Osenderos, he also questioned whether someone was feeding Abel Osendero lines during bathroom breaks during testimony. Smollett's defense ended their closing argument with a story about John Adams representing defendants at the Boston Massacre trial in 1770, reminding jurors that Smollett is innocent until proven guilty. Now, on a personal level, I will tell you, I wrote a book about John Adams' defense of the British soldiers. It's called John Adams Under Fire. And well, Nenya Uche, Jussie Smollett has a much weaker case than the majority of the British soldiers did. And I don't mean this as an attack on you because you have a tough case, but you are no John Adams. I had to say it. Back with us, attorneys Terry Austin and Mark Iglarsh. All right, Mark, so uh, do you have any hope here of an acquittal? Uh, no, but I'll make the argument, though, because that's what I do. Anthony Moore. He's a security guard who swears that he saw on the night in question 
white guys, white attackers, not black guys. So how do you get around that? I, I don't know if anyone's addressed it. I don't know what they said about yeah. it. That's the race in the hole. I start with that guy. I say he's not biased. He's not lack of credible believability. I, I build my case around him. Well, it was one. I think the allegation is that there was one uh, white guy. There is someone that he believed uh, was white. And that's a critical, the, this color of skin is an incredibly important issue in the case because Jussie Smollett had also originally said that his attackers were white. And then on the witness stand, and this is number five and six, he tried to explain that away saying, I didn't want to make the assumption they were white. So I, I said, let me just change that and said they were pale skinned. Could have been a white person, could have been a pale someone else. With the things they had said, I made the assumption that they were white. And uh, Terry Austin, he is talking about claims, racist claims, homophobic claims, uh, claims that this is MAGA country. Well, that's always my favorite line. It's MAGA country in Chicago, right? In the heart of Chicago is real MAGA country there. Um, but what do you make of, of Mark's point that that may be the ace in the hole? That could be the reasonable doubt. I don't think so, because if you look at it, it's all about Smollett's credibility. And here he is saying, oh, they were pale. Oh, they were white. We know that they were not. And even if you have one other person who says, eh, maybe they were white, we know for a fact, based on the video, based on the Austin Dario's brother's testimony, they are not white. They are nowhere near white. And so that's a big problem. And I, one of the things that I, I didn't even recall until recently is that Abel Osendero is actually a nationally ranked boxer. So, Mark, if this guy really wanted to beat up Jussie Smollett, he would have looked a lot worse than he did. Yeah, I agree with you. Look, this, this jury has two options in terms of a story. Number one, they go with bizarre. Or number two, they go with really bizarre. Either way, this is insane. And you're dealing with two guys, your star witnesses, who, I'm going to use a legal term, they're scumbags. I mean, they're either lying, if you believe the defense, or they went along with a scheme that to me is morally reprehensible. And not if, but when he's convicted, I want jail time for what he did. And I, but I don't know if that's going to happen. You think it's going to happen, Mark? I mean, Terry, Terry yes. didn't think so. We talked about that. You think it'll, that it'll get jail? See, I think so, too. I think, I think if there is a conviction on all six counts, that the judge is going to feel obligated to at least have him serve some time. But he should, not just because of politics, Dan. Every I'm not saying politics. I know. I'm saying know, the amount of time and effort that he has wasted of the police department there, of the prosecutors, of him continuing to fight this. That's why yes. I'm saying that he should serve time, and, not because of pressure. No, I, I'm with you. And then every future victim who's going to be scrutinized by police, rightfully so, because could they be another Smollett? And then you add the trial tax. We know it's there. It shouldn't be. But you go to trial and you lose, the judge yep. isn't going to say, now I'm going to punish you for going to trial. But the judge is going to say, now I'm going to be able to give you, because I heard all the facts, what I think is more appropriate in this case. We shall see. We could have a verdict tomorrow. Terry Austin and Mark Iglarsh, great to see you. Same here. Coming up. My husband just took my baby. He has a gun. 911 call says it all. Mom desperate after her boyfriend takes their child and runs. Cops arrive. We're on the scene with the amazing body cam from the Phoenix PD up next. We are on scene tonight with an incident that occurred with the Phoenix Police Department as a man kidnapped his own one year old son from the child's mother. A police synced up surveillance video with heart pounding 911 calls from a hotel clerk and the child's mother. And again, we should warn you, this video is difficult to watch. We've got an irate guest of another guest here chasing, running around with a gun here. Uh, we need somebody. Uh, he's beating up on his old lady. Ram Buren, hurry up. Ram Buren says, Seven thousand. My husband just took my baby. He has a gun. He's loaded. He took the baby. He's trying to kill him. He's shooting fire. He's shooting fire. Ram, hurry up. He's trying to shoot. He's going to kill people. The armed suspect, Paul Bolden, was still carrying the boy. 
As another caller said, he tried to carjack someone in a McDonald's drive through Then Bolden walked into traffic as police arrived. Drop the gun, dude! 511 in the He has a kid hostage right now. He has a gun. He has made one gunshot already. We need more units. Block off all traffic. Two more officers arrived. That's when Bolden pointed the gun at his child. Officers fired and then ran to rescue the boy. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. No! Get the kid! Get the kid! Come here, buddy! Come on! Come on! Come on! I got the kid! I got the kid! Hi, buddy. Hi, buddy. Hi, buddy. Are you okay? Hi, bud. I know. Bolden was pronounced dead at the hospital. Fortunately, the boy was not injured and no officers were hurt. The incident is still under investigation. Joining me again, Sean Stix Larkin, former Tulsa Police Lieutenant. Stix, we don't have a lot of time, so just tell me from your perspective what we just saw. Uh, you know, the first thing that stands out to me is obviously domestic violence type situations. These things can go uh, anyway. They're highly volatile. But the importance of an officer having a patrol rifle out there, you briefly see it in the video. He's got a scope on it. It allows him to make a precise one round shot to basically end this situation. Uh, he was forced upon it by the suspect's actions. The kid obviously was in danger. Citizens were in danger. And that was the only way this thing could have been resolved uh, as quickly as it did. That's got to be a heart-wrenching moment for that officer who's got to fire that weapon. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, listen, I'm a father. You know, any type of call that we've ever been on uh, at, at work that involves children, um, that's something that obviously we're very sympathetic to. Uh, we hate to see children put in these types of situations. So uh, it, it's something that luckily a lot of departments have counseling services for officers when they're in this type of situation, specifically with kids. And there is a specific rule of engagement for something like this as to when to fire that shot? Um, you know, there's not, you know, a, a, I guess a textbook that lays it out. But basically, anytime an officer believes that a citizen himself or somebody, uh, you know, has a potential for death and there's a way to stop it as quickly as possible, just as these guys did. Sean Larkin, good to see you. Thank you. You as well, Dan. That does it for us tonight. News Nation Prime starts right now. I'm still getting over watching that one. One-year-old baby, because I have a one-year-old at home. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.